Hello, this is Bob Moog with UG Studios, and today my guest is Mr. John Lee. John comes to us with a really, really incredible background in the uh, toy and game field. Uh, he worked at uh, CEO of Early Learning Centers and then got involved with, I guess that was after, that was most recently, that was after working for RC2, but his re where I got to know John and where he really made his mark in the toy industry was with Learning Curve International. Welcome, John. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here, Bob. I want to talk a little bit about Learning Curve and then a little bit about what you're doing now. Sure. And, uh, and uh, we're at Toy Fair, and um, let's start with that. What brings you to Toy Fair? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, it's February, and I've been doing it for so long, it's sort of muscle memory. Yeah. <laughs> so I pack my bags and I go to New York and get a badge. So I, I just, lo I love the industry. I've been in it for a while. I changed my, uh, you know, my, my, my role within the industry. So I'm And what, how many toy fairs have you come <coughs> to? This is one of those things, for those of you watching, everybody who comes to toy fair, after about your third toy fair, people keep track. <laughs> 30. 30 this toy fairs. 30. Wow. Yeah, 1990 was my first one. Wow. Fair. And have you, you haven't missed one in 30 years? Uh, no. Oh, I, I, that's have, amazing. I haven't missed New York. You know, yeah. I've missed uh, <laughs> Hong Kong and Nuremberg yeah. now and then, but New York, I'm, it's been 30 years. Well, that's the same. My first was 35, so I've got you beat by yeah. a couple of years oh. there. Was Learning Curve your first experience in the toy industry? My first experience in the toy industry was uh, Early Learning Center, yeah. the UK uh, toy company. Mm -hmm. They had transplanted to the U.S. I, I met them coming out of a venture capital group, shopping for a, a retail deal to buy. Mm -hmm. They were for sale, and I, I fell in love with the the category. Um, they had, were headquartered in in, uh, in Connecticut, and it was a turnaround workout. So I went in to see if I could fix it up, clean it up, buy it, mm -hmm. and and instead I found the market. I fell in love with the market. They were really a cutting edge. Uh, product offering and educational developmental toys. So that turnaround inspired me to develop what became Learning Curve Toys. So and out of the leftovers of Early Learning Center, I, I created Learning Curve. And what was your role in founding it and what was Dick Rothkoff's role in founding it? Mine was getting it started. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after about nine, ten months, Dick's job was to save my butt. <laughs> So did you bring him in, or did yeah, he come no, in did. as an investor, or how did it... Learning Curve was about nine months old when I met Dick, and uh -huh. I met Dick looking for a partner to help me launch the Lamaz brand. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go direct to consumer, and uh, he was considered the, the, the guru in, in continuity marketing mm -hmm. direct to consumer. So I met him in that context, but at the same time I was out, you know, every two years you're out passing the hat when right, you're growing Right, to get money, right. right. So I was out, I was looking for money, I had a you know a financial partner that I wanted to get rid of who wasn't so good, and I'm sharing my angst with Dick about you know my money. He said, he said basically schmuck. Why didn't right. did, when you tell me you right. needed? I doubt he said schmuck, but he, he probably said something no, stronger than that. No, no, no he, he said he, schmuck. He said schmuck. So, uh, <laughs> which, which he's, is he's he's quite a character. Quite a character. A term of endearment from yes. Dick. So anyway, uh, we quickly shifted from having a you know a. a strategic operating or a, par a partnership around a brand yeah. to a, a real partnership in the business. So when, when, when I w the company was almost a year old, Dick came on board as my, my first outside capital. Now for people who um, aren't familiar with Learning Curve Toy, <coughs> Learning Curve was the company that launched in specialty Thomas the Tank and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it really was a competitor to Brio at that time. Is that it right? It was. Yeah. In fact, it was an interesting transition. When I was running Early Learning Center, mm -hmm. between the UK and the US, we were Brio's largest customer. Mm -hmm. We were buying probably five, six million dollars in wholesale from them. So when I launched Thomas, uh, and I, I told the licensor at the time, I said, look, we're, we're going to be bigger than Brio. And so, yeah, we, we quickly became Brio's competitor. And where did the Thomas the Tank license come in the story? Because one of the things I find really interesting is <coughs> when you launch companies and when you're trying to build a company, there are people that are tacticians and people that are strategists. And don't know what you considered you yourself, but it <coughs> seemed like you and Dick had a very, very good strategy. You knew who you were competing against, and then you laid that license on, and it just took off. Well, it's an interesting s story. This is b before Dick. I mean, I, I was uh, working with the what was going to be the leftovers of Early Learning Center, and bef before we uh, exited Early Learning Center, uh, I convinced them to stop building stores 
and bring their brand to the retail market. Mm -hmm. So I launched initially in 1992, Early Learning Center Wholesale. And I said, we have to have, we have, to have a very compelling story to make the retailers see us as a manufacturer, mm -hmm. not as a competitor. Mm -hmm. So I said, we have to have something that they all stand up and salute and say, I've got to have it. So in our study of what 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 would meet that criteria, mm -hmm. we were the we were then the probably the number one retailer of anything Thomas. Yes. Uh, because we had the English roots, right? Mm -hmm. So it didn't take much to say Thomas Brio. If we brought them together, everybody would buy that. So the the genesis of the Thomas Wooden Train business really began as an early learning center initiative. Okay, I didn't and realize so, that. So I, I acquired that brand and that license out of Early Learning Center, mm -hmm. and I used that as the centerpiece. So you had that launch, right from the beginning right at Learning from the beginning. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was Early Learning. The, my first license with mm -hmm. the licensor was a, was a license with Early Learning Center. Okay. And I had to then convince them that, that, that John Lee could do it. Yeah, that, that you that, could do it. And so they transferred it to me and the rest is history. So. Could that happen again? I mean, if you if you today showed up and you wanted to, and you and you got a license, maybe it's not Thomas the Train, maybe it's not Thomas Wooden Trains, maybe there's something else. Could could learning curve happen again, or have the times changed so much well, it would it, be impossible it, now? It, the times are certainly different. I mean, we were rolling into a decade where money was being thrown at retail ideas like Imaginarium and Zany Brainy and Noodle Store Kadoodle. of Knowledge. So I was growing my business while there was a tsunami of new retail coming mm -hmm. along called Specialty. So I was able to grab that growth. That doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. But there are there are always new opportunities to create, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Oh, Tastemaker. Yes. A $10 million business. They, they identified some white space. They went after some licenses. Mm -hmm. They created a product. It was affordable. Bam, overnight, it's a $100 million business. Bonkers, yeah. you know bonkers? Mm -hmm. They built their business model around YouTube influencers. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is committed or dedicated to that space the way they are. And they launched with, uh, their Thomas was Ryan. Mm -hmm. And they went from, you know, zero to uh, whatever. Yeah. So it's still possible. It's still possible. It's just, it's a different, you have to take different routes because there's yeah. different forms mm -hmm. of communication and transportation. One of the things that I thought was really interesting um, about your time, both at RC2 and at uh, Learning Curve, was that you seem to position yourself as a leader in the industry through a lot of different things. And I just was wondering, where do you see leadership coming from? Where where does the toy industry get leadership, or how does any industry get leadership? And how do, how do you find those people to be the leaders in the industry? I don't think that you know b being a leader in the industry was a was a goal. It was I, I, I think sometimes it comes by from not knowing what you're doing mm -hmm. and trying something different that others others might not do in the business, mm -hmm. and bam, you you pop out. And right. The, the, the next and then thing people you know, are asking you to right. do things because right. they see you have ideas. Right. That's interesting. Now, what about what you're doing now? You're not making toys right now. You're working more in helping companies to grow and also to sell. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about yeah, what the, you're doing the, now? It, my, uh, throughout my career, one of the things that I've enjoyed most is deal making. Business development, you know, licensing partnerships, or raising money, or s s buy and sell. So seven, eight years ago, I decided to really focus on that aspect of the industry and the business, and so I created a, an M&A boutique, and so I help companies that want to sell, sell. If you want to buy something, I help you buy. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's, it's a great. And what do you like about that? Like, I understand, I run a toy company, I understand the fun of developing product or doing, um, getting a license. What's the fun of yeah. Being What's the fun of mergers I'll and acquisitions? I'll tell you, the, the, you know, when, when, when you see a, the, an entrepreneur or, or a couple who put in 10, 20, 30 years, and that's their baby, mm -hmm. that's all their net worth, the, the thrill that comes from seeing a good outcome for those people is really what, it, 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 it's what drives me. So, wow. I mean, you can make money at it, so yeah. the money's good, but I, I really like so seeing, the, seeing the great outcome of... Uh, you know, it's like I sold Brio to Ravensburger. Yeah. It was just, it was such a, 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 an exclamation point in yeah. my career. And the Brio people were thrilled, the Ravensburger, Ravensburger people, people were thrilled, and it was, it, it was, just, a, it was just a real feel good. So I, I really. And did you, was there any kind of cognitive dissonance of Brio having been your competitor when you actually had your, of course. your big business <laughs> and then you got to be the guy selling them? Well, I know? tried to buy them in oh, 1998 you tried to buy them. when okay. we brought in our first round of private equity at Learning Curve. We tried to buy them. 
they 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 didn't want to be sold. They didn't want to be sold that. No, and they they said they would never go to China, which yeah. eventually they they had to change that rule. But mm -hmm. it it was actually ref it was actually refreshing in some respect to go back and and still have a good relationship with those people. They That's were always right. friends, you know, yeah. even though we were competitors. That's, That's right. another thing I love about this business is that. There is an ugly, you know, competitive for the most part. Yeah. But, it, but it, I think there's a lot of collaboration. In this there is. Thing. People yeah. will be yeah. competing. We compete with companies in the U.S. whose products we mm -hmm. sell in the U.K. Yeah. And everyone works together. Yeah. One last question: um, Do you have a favorite game from when you were a kid or that you play now? Monopoly was really a favorite when that came along. But I liked Parcheesi and Sorry. Mm -hmm. And then later in life, my my my. Uh, my in-laws discovered Ru Ruby Cu Ruby Cube, Rubik's Cube, Ru Rumi no Rumi Cube. Oh, Rumi Cube, yeah, yeah Rumi Cube. Yeah. So, but sorry, yeah, those Parcheesi. are all Parker Brothers game. You were a Parker yeah, Brothers I was, kid. Yeah, I didn't realize it. But <laughs> I, I, I was too. Was, My favorites yeah. were Clue yeah. and Risk and Stratego. Yeah. Stratego was Milton Bradley, but the other two were yeah. Parker Brothers. Yeah, and I excelled at Monopoly, so yeah. it's, it's 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 probably very telling. Well, Monopoly's about making money, and now you're in the M and A business, and right. that's about yeah. making money. Yeah. So, good job. Good dealing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much. It was so great talking to you, and um, please you, tune in next time. All right, <laughs> thanks.